The defense and aerospace sectors are at the forefront of innovation, driven by the need for advanced solutions to ensure national security and operational effectiveness. Today, we have the privilege of learning about the collaborative journey between Element U.S. Space and Defense, a longstanding government testing partner and innovator in space exploration since the 1960s, and Texas Tech University's Mechanical Engineering Department and we'll explore how their partnership is cultivating groundbreaking advancements in defense technology. As we engage with Dr. John Grenier, Chief Engineer of Munitions and Energetics at Element US Space and Defense, and Dr. Michelle Pantoya from the Texas Tech Combustion Lab, we will uncover the process and challenge that define the development of innovative defense solutions. Thank you both for joining us today. Hello. So the impetus for today's conversation was a press release that I had received about Element partnering with Texas Tech for an innovative uh, propellant ignition study. So why don't you guys describe the relationship between Element and Texas Tech and how the partnership has evolved over time? Well, you know, as an academic, um, I manage projects and mentor students along the way. Um, as our lab has grown, we have a large group of students, mainly graduate students, all U.S. citizens working pretty much on national security and national defense topics. Um, and I firmly believe in educating um, at that level. So I actually don't have postdoc students that are like middle management. And, um, and so sometimes it's really helpful to have insight from people who are seasoned um, experts in our field of energetic materials, not only to kind of help guide the safety um, aspects, but also uh, to mature designs that are at a higher level than what you would normally get from a, um, a like a recent graduate or an early um, graduate student. So I would define our relationship as sort of a, a unique opportunity to lend mature, I don't know how to say it, but um, subject matter expertise to um, mentor students without that and they're trying to garner that. Um, so he's, he, I would say that in a, a lot of ways, John also acts like more than just a mentor, but kind of like a, like an, a, like a, a, I don't know, how would you explain it, John? Yeah, so to agree, that was a, a different type of thought I had, but the students there are going to be trying to complete the experiments. Element will be advising to them, adding some reality, adding some uh, perspective to the full system in the future that they're just young and they don't know that. They haven't seen that yet. So they don't know how, let's say, the Army would really apply this data yet. And we are a little bit closer to that step on the full application and the full breadth of testing needs or breadth of design innovation required. So we're, we're linking that bridge to a little bit for a university study. And I think this is actually a model that, um, that could start to be adopted by more faculty that do active research because it's, it really streamlines the process. It like accelerates the learning curve um, and I think students benefit so much from it um, that it it it's it's a model that I isn't often used in our field and probably should be implemented more. Now, John, before Michelle hopped on, you were saying you've known each other for quite a long time. I was one of her first graduate students, so I actually studied or we started the combustion lab a long time ago, more than twenty years ago. Um, yeah. So I graduated and got a career in the defense sector and that's grown to be a lot more applied obviously than those initial studies so now linking back I enjoy working with the students I enjoy doing research still my career has always been on the defense research side so as an advisor to her we kind of synced up on this one topic that we're but that press release was regarding um, I've done a lot of gun research, but she or the combustion lab has done more fundamental combustion research. I've done more application research. Can give me an example of an innovative defense solution that's emerging from the partnership 
And then you can also, if you want to um, split off, not about the partnership, also share examples of innovative uh, solutions that are emerging. So this particular project um, has to do with, or this partnership that we're forming is mainly focused on ignition of gun propellants. And that can be small gun systems like 5.56 five, or 762 up to large 155 tank rounds. And independently, Michelle was looking at this and discussing this with uh, Picatinny Arsenal with researchers there. Independently, Element was discussing this with Picatinny Arsenal. And then whenever she and I linked up together to say this was a joint interest to study for the Army Research Center, then that's when we said we, we can work on this together and hopefully build it a little bit faster. But the study is really early uh, heat transfer and energy mechanisms for that ignition process. Are you going to be using maybe um, any additive manufacturing to um, do any of the heat transfer components or? Not, not, not us specifically, but Picatinny Arsenal does have that technique and technology to additively manufacture propellant grains. Um, and that may come into this study. I can see that coming in later. It's kind of been suggested already that they can modify the chemistry or modify the geometry of the propellants so that we can study more variables. So can you tell me um, a little bit about where you're at with this project? I know you said it's really early on. It's not just the, the, the technology that we're innovating. Along the way, we end up innovating the methodologies to advance the technology. Does that make sense? So like, for example, in, in my group, um, we're innovating the way that we quantify, um, just like John said, energy conversion processes. So we're looking at how heat is transferred from, for, for example, the igniter, a powder. And it goes not just into heating gases, that surround the powder, but also into um, like radiant emission. So heating another solid in nearby and understanding how much of the energy goes into the gas phase versus how much energy goes to the condensed phase is not trivial. And so we're trying to advance our methods for quantifying those values. And that will tell us a lot because once we can, once we understand how the energy moves, then we can control formulations to make the energy move the way we want it. Is this a brand new way of a propellant or uh, is... No, I, don't no, the say, I don't want to say the propellant's new, but the diagnostics right. or the techniques are new. Okay, so there's nothing yet that's able to do what you plan to do they, with your... And that's, that's where the history of it comes. Element has been talking about this for almost a decade with Picatinny, and some studies have been done in the past, but they were very limited on their measurement techniques. Um, and with the combustion lab there, they have a diagnostic technique called digital thermography. So this is using a digital high-speed camera with some filters and software to actually back out temperatures um, calculate temperatures. That is a new technique for sure applied to this problem set. And to be able to apply that diagnostic at fast time speeds is also very critical. That's exactly right. So are the sure. results that you're getting with that software and it's almost like real time or? Slow motion. So um, the okay. things that you wouldn't be able to see with your eye, like real time um, doesn't capture all the details. So we, we just, we put it all in slow motion so we can see every millisecond. And it's in milliseconds that we find the new things. And that's been what's going to inform new, you know, new formulations. But we're, we're stepping back. It's not the new formulations that we're studying quite yet. It's just trying to figure out how to use this new diagnostic to understand basic processes like gas flowing through um, pebbles, 
you know, I mean, just basic fundamental processes. And then once we get that working, then we can start um, hopefully developing new, uh, a new insight that will lead to new developments for the Army. I, I think what you were asking about the real time was like, how fast can we make a conclusion? Um, and basically, there's going to be a lot of scientific study on whatever data map we get, whatever high speed video data or thermal mapping data. There's going to be some back calculations, some physics diagnostics or physics calculations to say what the next iteration would be, what the next variable to study would be, things like that. You've demonstrated that collaboration and knowledge sharing is obviously so important. So how do you foster collaboration between engineers, researchers, and government officials during a project? And what communication strategies have proven effective? I find collaboration absolutely critical, honestly. I th Again, I'm very student-centric, so it's good for the students to see the customer. And it's like John said, the um, if the customer's industry or um, one of the federal agencies, it's like he said, there's, um, there's value in that contextual understanding of the problem. And that that customer is really the person who can frame the problem the best. And then that problem is like the hook that keeps us motivated to figure out a way to solve the problem because essentially that's what engineers are. We're problem solvers. And so then we start using, you know, fundamentals to go back to the, to the physics or the chemistry that's guiding or governing um, the problem at hand. I was going to say, like, it is greatly convenient that we all can communicate through these electronic means nowadays, and the transfer of data is very fast. So we can share a new result with experts all around the United States very quickly and get their input, get their feedback. That's valuable. But there is still a great value to doing face-to-face -face visits because we are engineers and there's hardware involved. So no matter how great you try to describe some system apparatus or methodology without being there in person, we still need to do these face-to-face -face visits and either see, like she said, the end product, the, let's say it's the 120 millimeter tank shell um, like the students need to see that and understand what I'm studying isn't going to fit exactly correctly, or that engineer that designed that tank needs to see the student's experiment and say, maybe if you did it this way, it would be a little bit better or give more valuable data. So the face-to-face -face visits are still super valuable.